ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching The John Woodard Show. We have the pleasure today of interviewing congressional candidate Sandy Smith. Uh, Sandy, how are you, honey? Good. It's so good to see you. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you. I'm doing awesome. <laughs> Busy. You've been, you're a hardworking lady. There's nobody that's going to work any harder than you, and that's evidenced by all the effort that you put into it. Uh, tell me about some of the activities that you've been in, in that to uh, uh, draw attention to your campaign. Well, we've definitely been going all across the, the district, the new second district. We've been to all 18 counties. Uh, we're out there knocking doors, making phone calls, meeting the folks, actually, so they can put a face with a name and listening to what they are really wanting to see done in the second district. Uh, this is a really exciting time for us because, you know, we've never had this opportunity before where the, the Democrats are all jumping ship. The, um, I think it, it speaks volumes to my success in 2020 when I swung, uh, which was formerly the, the first district, now the second district, 25 points towards the Republicans, something that never had been done. And in the primary, I blew the doors off of the, the, four, the three other candidates as a four-way race and one uh, with 77 uh, point, uh, I think it was 3% of the vote uh, last time. So that was really um, exciting. And that was before, you know, we, we had done a lot of work, but I still did not have the name recognition that I do have, that I have now. So it, it's been, it's, it's a lot of hard work, but a lot of fun because you get to meet so many great people like yourself. Well, the, you know, the uh, going to large events and and spending time walking around and saying hello and shaking people's hands, that kind of retail uh, uh, politicking, uh, you just can't put a price on it. You're absolutely correct. And the thing is, a lot of folks think you just go to GOP events or Republican political events. And the thing is, I go to events throughout my community and I meet people from all walks of life and that have all different types of issues and, and, and concerns. And by reaching out to them, I'm reaching a whole nother level of, of voters in the community. And a lot of folks miss that. I mean, I, I do a lot of gun shows, a lot of big folks. Uh, do, you know, I'm a proud Second Amendment uh, uh, supporter. I'm a concealed carry permit holder. And I go to the gun shows because I talk to a lot of different folks that we agree on a second amendment rights, but we also have other things that we agree on. And they, I have, I don't know how many people I've come, I've uh, come across now like, Hey, I met you at the gun show or in, you know, that kind of stuff. And we do other community service stuff throughout the community. I, work, I do a lot of work with my church. So uh, yeah, it's, it's great. Well, the new second district is mighty big. It was, it, uh, the, uh, there's all, uh, I was not surprised uh, that, uh, Congressman Butterfield uh, bowed out. Uh, certainly looks like that that has become a trend up there in Washington. Uh, but boy, you've got a, a quite a crowded field to compete against, don't you? We have we have quite a few people that have jumped in the race because of all the hard work I did last time. I, I basically did the groundwork, plowed the field, and now we have a lot of folks that feel they'll just jump in and just, you know, win a nomination. They don't understand what really goes into winning and then also being able to get to the general and win. I'm the only one that's running that can actually get to the general and beat the Democrats. The reason why G.K. Butterfield decided to retire wasn't because he was ready to retire. It was because we almost took him out. And, and some people will argue, including myself, that we believe we did take him out. Um, there were shenanigans that happened in North Carolina and across our country, and we're not going to sit here and dwell on that. But at the same time, those are those are facts. Uh, GK knew he did not want to take me on again uh, with the redistricting. They had taken out Durham out of his district last cycle, and then this current cycle, um, he utilized Pitt County as his new hub to to really like um, get votes. Well, they drew that out of the new second district. So he knew that there was nowhere for him to really manufacture his 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 Democrat base, if you will. And honestly, his his um, policies do not align with rural Democrats or Republicans. They just don't. Well, the, it's uh, absolutely right. 
I'm sure that you've been working hard on the campaign contributions of asking people to support your candidacy. Are you having any real success with that? Absolutely. Um, I don't have my exact numbers um, finalized for this current uh, uh, what January filing for the fourth quarter. However, last like uh, last uh, um, filing period, I was in the top 15 percent in the entire country, meaning I was out raising actual sit sitting incumbents. Um, and that's because we you know, I, I call folks, I reach out and I earn their support. Um, I think I have um, a huge number. I want to say it was like over 8,000 donors that are under $200. Those are each individual votes. Those are great, you know, um, donors to have. It's fantastic to have a max out donor, but they can only vote once. So, and, and once you've, you've gotten, you know, your friends and family that have maxed out, what more can you do unless you have true support across the area from, from voters? With, with all the the campaign events that you go to and all the uh, activities that you're involved in trying to get the word out how how have how's been the feedback from the people that you've been talking to in the district they are so excited uh november 2022 can't come fast enough um it's very apparent we want they want an america first pro-trump pro-life pro-gun uh it, candidate that and nominee that's going to go to Washington and fight for their rights and and uh, my my base has not gone away it's actually grown which is fantastic um, they're happy that I have been one of the few that's been out there advocating for all these different issues that our states you know in, in country is dealing with I mean we have these um, our medical freedoms are under attack right now where they're they're trying to mandate a vaccine. Uh, they are masking our children. They're teaching CRT, which is not a subject. It is a theory that they have sprinkled all across all of our subjects um, in the school. And the government feels that they can do a better job at running your life and raising your children than you can. So well, it was quite interesting to see that uh, this that it's finally been exposed that uh, the uh, the the memo from the Department of uh, Justice about uh, the uh, involvement of families and that all of that hurrah that you heard about up there in Loudoun County, that that actually came from the, uh, from the groups that provided the language that, be, that uh, for the memo to be drafted. I mean, uh, Boy, talk about getting your cut, getting your getting caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Exactly, exactly. And I think what we saw happen not only in the school districts in, in Virginia, but in Virginia with the governor's race and the and the uh, lieutenant governor's race and in the entire um, what are they they parl or they call theirs and uh, it's, it's it, their general assembly, if you will. Um, basically a sweep across the board for Republicans. We took back control uh, uh, of Virginia. And I think that we need to replicate that here in North Carolina. Now, a lot of folks, you know, we've talked about, you know, election integrity and, and I have been pushing our state legislators to make changes and to look into 2020, but also make changes for 2022 so we don't have the same thing happen. I, but I tell folks, we have to do what Virginia did, and that is beat the machines, meaning we have to overpower the machines by coming out in numbers. You know, they couldn't manufacture enough votes to overcome the amount of people that came out for Virginia. And so we need to do that here. We need to just come out and not sit home, and we have to take action. Have you met uh, Sloan Rackmuth? Yeah, she's wonderful. She is an advocate for our parents and our children and has been fighting hard for uh, CRT in our classroom. She's fantastic. Uh, she's a very hardworking. She uh, she is about as hardworking as you are. Uh, so uh, uh, she's uh, done a great job in trying to get people aware. And I think a lot of parents are finally waking up uh, to the uh, threat that their children face just to go to school every day. Oh, it's it's sad, and and I can say there's if there's one thing that's come out of uh, out of COVID was the the, um, the the parents' eyes being open to what their children are really being taught in school, and I think what I mean these these surveys, 
uh, these things where we're trying to to instill in children that they're victims and that that we have and that white children are victimizers. I mean, this is crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. And and the, and the sex education, oh. it, it, you know, I I was at a, I was at a um, God and Country Christian Alliance meeting uh, in uh, New Bern one night. And they had uh, uh, speakers that were there to talk about that. And when they were done, I mean, I stood up and said, "Is there anybody else besides me that thinks they need to take a shower?" I mean, this was this was pathetic, uh, uh, grossly graphic, uh, in, in, and there and there and it's right there in in the school uh, where the kids can pull the those library. books out and look at them. It's, Sex I, between children and men, good Lord, I pray. It is sickening, absolutely sickening. And I have to say, I stand firmly and proudly behind our Lieutenant Governor, Mark Robinson, for calling out the smut that's in our library of our schools. And thank, thank God that he brought it to everyone's attention so it could be removed. And the thing is, I believe that every educator that it came in contact with that information whether it was the librarian, the teacher in the classroom, or the, the school board member that approved it, needs to be prosecuted. It is Absolutely. it is sexual. It is basically uh, pornography of our children, and it is it's disgusting. I don't care if it if it's uh, you know heterosexual, homosexual. What it's sex, and and it's it, things that do not need to be in our school libraries. That and that's totally different than biology. Biology is one thing. This is not. This is stuff that's in there their their uh, English class I mean come on it is sickening and um, the, the the verbiage oh, gosh and the thing is they are trying to normalize it with our children that's why they're trying to normalize this, this pedophilia stuff that's going on crazy and rampant through our media corporations and things like that and these folks pushing this this filth it is filth oh and, I mean I'm getting fired up on that mess. <laughs> That's our children. I, I, you know, uh, That's our children, uh, babies. It's pretty daggone bad when adults uh, uh, see uh, graphic materials and and are in in their, in their uh, taken so aback by what they're seeing that they that they you know feel that they're that that they they just feel awful to have their kids exposed to that sort of stuff. It, it, it's pathetic. It is pathetic. I mean, honestly, some of it's worse than what you would find in adult uh, romance novel. An adult, you know, one of those uh, things that, you know, I don't read, but I mean, there, there are folks that read those things, but that's that, those are adults. And we're, yeah. we're giving them to our kindergartners, our fifth graders, our innocent children. They're, 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 they're trying to steal their innocence. And you know what? When I get to Washington, I'm going to fight so we can preserve it as much as we can and protect our children. What goals do you have for yourself uh, back here in the district and in Washington? Well, first of all, I want to really focus on bringing job opportunities and business opportunities here to Eastern North Carolina. We have so many, we have great resources here, but we have to have people that are that are creative in regards to um, getting folks to, you know, motivating businesses to invest here. Um, we also need to basically use a, a use our platform from Washington to help bring up some of our local governments so they can, you know, because it's not a magic wand that I can wave and make everything wonderful. But um, it's something that we can do together and um, build Eastern North Carolina. We need to we need to focus on this broadband Internet stuff that we've been telling everybody that they're going to bring to us for for years. And we have nothing. It's crazy that we have broadband out in the mountains, but we don't have in Eastern North Carolina. And I'm talking, I'm in some of the, the, the city areas and we don't have great internet service. Um, there's lots of opportunity. I know Elon Musk and his Starlink has opportunities for places where we cannot lay um, uh, broadband uh, internet core, uh, you know, uh, fiber optics and things of that nature. Um, but we can get these folks the internet because that's another thing that hangs up businesses from coming our, to our community is we're in 2022 and nine, uh, nine times out of 10, most businesses operate online or do or, or have uh, computer, do something in some capacity in regards to technology. So they have to have access to the internet and whether that's they have people that work at home, whether they have an online store, 
whatever it may be, we have to have those tools available so those folks will come here and invest. And, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're, we're focusing on our children and making sure that, you know, we, we are getting parent, you know, giving parents the tools that they need. We need to get government out of our homes and our lives and, but give them the opportunity and resources they need. Well, the, one of the, uh, issues, uh, in, in any agricultural area such as this, you've got population centers, uh, and, and most of the population uh, of the state is in four or five key cent centers in the state. And then you've got all this open area. A, fr a guy that I uh, talked to several years ago um, told me a story that his brother was the uh, uh, chairman or the head man over at, uh, at Haynes in uh, Winston-Salem. And he had talked about his brother about, you know, doing some manufacturing uh, in uh, the eastern part of the state. And, and we said his brother uh, got in a plane and flew over it, came back and told him, so, you haven't got enough rooftops. I was going to say, I've heard that exact phrase, not enough rooftops. And I have to say that we are a growing community. And, but if we can encourage businesses to come here, folks will be here and, and will want to move here and we will have, you know, we can build more homes. I mean, I've got builders that, yes, they are very busy. I mean, my husband, we're, we're builders and um, we, we have a lot of different projects, but I believe that, uh, you know, we, we were talking about the, well, not we, but I was talking about some of the charter schools. And we had a charter school out in a rural area and, you know, it, it took a year before it kind of took off. Now it has a waiting list and folks are trying are trying to buy homes, build homes out in that area. So their their population is starting starting to increase. But we even have in those those heavily populated areas, we have opportunities that we can expand even further. I mean, uh, to, these businesses to come to come here and and, and um, you know, increase our tax base, if you will, by, by up opening up their home office and things like that. You know, it was really tragic. We had that QVC fire, but a lot of folks didn't know that we were, that the QVC was struggling with security issues because, um, you know, they were not, you know, our police in, in, that, in Rocky Mount is very, you know, short staffed. So, I mean, we, we have to make sure that our communities have the law enforcement and, um, in, in, in tools that they need so they can protect not only our citizens, but also give security to our, our companies. Because if we've got folks that are leaving our area because of high theft and they're, they're, they're losing profits because of things walking out the back door, that means we have a problem. We need to be stepping up and taking action. And, and that means, you know, take, adding more, more police to our area so they can, they can patrol the area and give them assistance because we want more businesses to come. We want people to be broadcasting, this is the best place to do business, which in my eyes, we can definitely make it that if, if we try hard and we, we get focused. The agricultural base that we've got here, mm -hmm. it's amazing to me that we've got uh, right here in this, in this area, one of the largest potato farmers in the, in the entire country, and he ships all of his potatoes to Texas to make potato chips. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It it's is crazy, crazy. But, yeah. but that's why we have to take care of our farmers. And that that's the thing, it's a juggling act that you, we need to make sure that we are taking care of all of our citizens and taking care of our farmers because they are a vital, important part of our community here in Eastern North Carolina. And, but then we also have areas that we can develop that are not going to impact our farming community. So that's where we need to balance everything and encourage the growth because that's what's going to what's going to build our community and take us from being one of the poorest districts in the country to one of the richest uh, districts in the country. How do you feel about uh, the problem of the money following the children when they and you know going? From so that you know, kids are not forced to go to into uh, public schools, children, families can have school choice. I am a strong advocate of parent school choice, meaning the parents can choose where their child wants to go, where their child should go to school. I'm a firm believer and supporter that the dollars that are allotted to our child children for their education should follow them to whichever school 
they go to, whether it's a private school, whether it's a charter school, whether it's a public school, or even a home school, a parent should have the ultimate choice. And, um, you know, we should not um, force children to attend school and go somewhere uh, based strictly on their zip code. Um, they should be they should be able to take their child anywhere they want. Now, I'm not saying that we should have public school that should be offering free transportation from one from one side of town to the other when there's like three schools in between. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if a parent elects to send their child to a, a private school, that those tax dollars should follow them. It would cause uh, a competition in the in the in the school play. I'd say workplace, but it's a school in the schools. And, um, you know, when, when schools have to be competitive for those do dollars, they tend to, uh, to produce more positive results. And I think that's, that's what w we need to do. We need to make sure that our teachers, uh, that our school boards are not an extension of our school, uh, our uh, teachers unions. And they need to, we need to have our, our school boards be more uh, the makeup of, the, of parents, actual parents and and really be fighting for the children and looking into what's you know being brought into the schools but yes i think every parent should have the ultimate choice on where they send their child for school period honey uh, we could talk all day but uh is there is there any one uh closing remark that uh that you think uh, you really want to hit home, uh, let people know where you stand. Something that's extreme, that's really important to you on a, on a personal as well as a political level. Absolutely, I want to say this: 2022 is pretty much a make or break year for our country. We see the 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 road that the Democrats want to take us down a socialist, communist path. And we cannot sit back as Americans, as conservatives, and do nothing. We need to make sure that when we go to the polls during the primary season, that we are, are electing folks and nominating folks that can actually beat the Democrats in the general. We need folks that are continuous fighters, that are not going to give up, that do not bow down and kiss the ring to any establishment, and that will answer only to the people and will fight for the people. We need someone who's going to stand up for life. We need to fight for for um, our Second Amendment. We need to secure our borders. We need to have election integrity. When I get to Washington, my focus is to work for the people. And I would love to have your support. I would love to have your vote, both in uh, our primary, which is scheduled right now for May 17th, as well as the general in uh, November. And you can also go to my website, at sandysmithnc.com. I could definitely, you can sign up to to help and, and volunteer to do anything from making phone calls to knocking doors to hanging signs. Or if you, if you want to make a, a financial donation, which is greatly appreciated because that's what I need to get my message out on the airways and to get signs out there. Um, you can do that by going to the website. John, thank you so much for, for having me. It's been an absolute pr a pleasure. You are a true patriot. And don't stop what you're doing. We love you. Uh, I'm glad to have had this opportunity to talk to you, and I look forward to seeing you on the trail. Thank you, John. You have a great day. Thank you, you too.